um, good evening. So glad to see um, folks coming in and joining us for the discussion we're going to be having. Um, my name is Mina Schultz. I'm a senior advisor here at Healthcare Awareness Month, um, and I'm a healthcare advocate and activist. I got my start in ad activism um, while living in West Virginia, doing some railing against the 2017 Affordable Care Act repeal efforts. Um, and I've been lucky enough to advocate in Congress with, with Healthcare Awareness Month co-founder Peter Morley a few times. Um, my day job also in, includes um, advocacy. Um, I work to help young people learn about the Affordable Care Act and navigate their health coverage options. So um, tonight we're gonna be delving into a, a really important topic, um, one that's very personal to me and I think to our panelists as well. Um, which is exploring the needs of the disability community. It's a, a beautiful and diverse community, but um, we face barriers that, you know, currently able people may not be able to even consider in their day to day activities and communications. So we'll be uh, giving you a little deeper view of the policies that have impacted the disability community over the years and share with you some personal experiences of those living um, with disabilities. So we'll also address um, what what some folks might be might have on their minds tonight, how COVID-19 has affected this community um, and how our lives have changed over the course of the pandemic. So um, I guess I'm going to go ahead and introduce our amazing panelists. Our first panelist tonight, we're happy to have with us Carl Cooper, Director of Public Health Programs at the American Association on Health and Disability. Next, we have um, a person of many talents. She is not only an advocate, but an artist, an educator, and a mo motivational speaker, Emily Wu Trong. Um, and then last but not least, I think many of you probably know him already, but we've got patient advocate Peter Morley with us to, to have this conversation. So I will let these folks um, introduce themselves here in a sec, but first, um, just as we go through our conversation, I invite you all to put your questions into the chat box uh, so we can answer those um, towards the end of the conversation. Um, I also want to empower you, empower you to share your own stories in the chat if you feel moved to do so, no pressure. Um, but we want this to be kind of an, an open and inclusive space. So again, we're glad that you're here with us this evening. Um, and just to get us started, I'm going to now pass the mic over to our panelists to introduce themselves and, and give you a bit of background um, so you all know where each is coming from in their advocacy. So I will, I will pass it over to you, Peter, first, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Me. Um, I'll go, why don't I, well, let's shuffle it up a little bit. Let's, uh, let's let Carl, if that's okay with you. Let's let Carl or- uh, Go for it, Carl. Sure, no problem. Happy to happy to lead us off. Um, yes, my name is Carl Cooper. I'm the director of public health programs at the American Association on Health and Disability. Uh, a little bit about my organization. First, uh, we are a national cross disability organization uh, that is that works to promote uh, health and wellness uh, for people with disabilities. Uh, we are located just outside of Washington D.C. in Rockville, Maryland. Uh, so we are, uh, and as I said before, we're cross disability. So we look at not, not just uh, physical disabilities, but also intellectual and developmental disabilities and mental health disabilities uh, and sensory disabilities. So we, we really do try and reach every uh, community as it relates to uh, their health care and specifically trying to do what we can to help with uh, health and wellness. Uh, my own uh, personal uh, story, I am a person with a disability myself. I have physical disabilities um, that uh, require me to use a power wheelchair, although I can walk short distances, uh, but I do use a wheelchair for any uh, distance walking. I also would um, point out that in terms of uh, historically with my career, I started out as an attorney and worked as an attorney for several years uh, in the Philadelphia area, which is where I'm originally from. Uh, before moving to the D.C. area and, and getting involved in uh, disability advocacy at the national level. Uh, so that's uh, that's my story. Awesome. Thank you, Carl. So happy to have you here. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Emily now. Hello, everyone. My name is Emily Wu Trong. I am based in Los Angeles, particularly the San Gabriel Valley. Um, I think I've, as, as an advocate, I've actually been 
more so an advocate about um, wanting people to feel like they are someone of worth. And I think I've always been an advocate since I was uh, in junior high and inspired by Martin Luther King Jr. Um, as a civil rights advocate and activist. And I, I you know, grow up with emotional struggles and have become a, a mental health advocate um, with the, Nas the National Alliance on Mental Illness, uh, NAMI, uh, Greater Los Angeles County. And um, for the last 10 years, I've been facilitating support groups um, and classes for NAMI. And I mean, the reason why I went into this space because the stigma of mental illness, mental health is just so strong to the point that the shame is, keeps people from speaking out. And I only found my voice in 2010, 2013, when I was trying to address the stigma and I went to the podium the first time I spoke out, I said, I will not end my life because I have a story to share. The more we talk about mental health, mental illness, the more we will alleviate the stigma. There is no shame, there is no shame. And since my advocacy started, I have, done over 140 speaking engagements and since and and I just want to empower other people to not stay silent and know that their voice matters and and um, you know because the, the shame is just so strong but with me sharing my own story, I hope I can empower others to know that they're not alone and, and that with help, there is hope. So thank you for having me here. Absolutely, thank you for sharing that. And I, I wanna flag that, you know, story sharing is a lot of what Healthcare Awareness Month is all about. So um, really appreciate having you here and all of the work that you do for mental health advocacy. Um, and then last but certainly not least, Peter Morley. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Carl and Emily for, um, for being here and Nina, of course, as always. And of course, I just screwed up my uh, screen here. So I cannot remember these, these words. Uh, although I've told my story many times at this point, um, I'm just, I'm very humbled, uh, always humbled to, uh, to be joined by such wonderful advocates and activists. Um, you know, Social Security just turned 87 on uh, August 14th. And it's a big deal to me because I, I rely on uh, Social Security disability uh, income as a person with disability. It's my only source of income. And I'd like to share my personal story, of my journey from a patient to a national advocate on healthcare and social security. In 2007, I was permanently disabled from an accident and unable to work any more. I was so fortunate to be spared the entire cost of my medical bills because I had continuous insurance coverage, but since I can no longer work, I had to apply for social security disability. And I can't say this enough, it is a daunting task applying for SSDI between the application, the waiting period, the physical examination, it was months. And that is if you are incredibly privileged as I was to be awarded disability in my first try. And it wasn't until years later that I found out how people in my chronic illness communities had to reapply several times before they were approved. Their waiting times are years and all that with no income. Who can live like that? No income. I will always be grateful I was approved because I, was subse I subsequently had 10 surgeries in 15 years. 
including four spinal surgeries. And in 2011, I was diagnosed through an incidental finding with kidney cancer. Uh, and I lost part of my right kidney, but I fought my way into remission. I've had diagnoses over the last 15 years that have catapulted me well above 10 pre existing conditions, and I had to stop counting to get through my day to day. In 2013, I was diagnosed with my primary health concern to date, which is lupus, and it's very challenging with its fatigue. It's sometimes a real struggle to get out of bed, I take 38 different medications yearly, and without access to insurance, there's no way I could afford to pay for these medications. I'd lose my access to team of, uh, my team of doctors that are keeping me alive. So without my SSDI and Medicare, I wouldn't be speaking to you today. I would have perished. And there's no easy way to say that. And yet there are so many people that have lost their battles just waiting to be approved for the program. And I used to be, I mean, a lot of you know who I am, but I used to be very private about my health. But once President Trump was elected and set to repeal the ACA and gut Social Security and Medicare, I could no longer be silent. And in 2016, I decided to advocate for health care and Social Security on Twitter. In five and a half years, I've traveled to Washington, D.C., now 33 times. I've collected the stories of thousands of people who shared their health care stories and their concerns with me held over 700 advocacy meetings with Democratic and Republican members of Congress alike. I've testified and have been very honored to testify before three separate House committees. People on Social Security Disability and SSDI and SSI have shared with me because of the threats recently stated by Senate Republicans that they feel alone, scared, and afraid when they should be focusing their energy on their own well-being. When I was able to work, I paid into Social Security as we all do. While most people think of Social Security as only being there for retirement, it also provides payments to the long-term disabled for people like me who are no longer able to work. And I know this country's disability system works because I've had to rely on it through numerous major healthcare crises. It is so crucial, as Emily said, and Mina said, and Carl said, share your stories because by sharing your healthcare journeys, you are putting a human face to what would otherwise be considered data. This is the reason I continue my advocacy, the reason I fight so hard, it energizes me. These last five and a half years has given me a new sense of purpose in my life. I like to believe that you are not only listening to my voice, that the voices of thousands of others I represented, and some of which are no longer with us. My dream is that I will live to see the day there is greater and more accessibility to obtaining Social Security disability. Thank you so much. Thanks, Peter. So glad to have you here. Your story is always very touching, and um, your advocacy is appreciated by a lot of people. I know that if you look at Peter's Twitter, you see that a lot of people reach out to Peter with um, their stories and he's he's been wonderful at sharing those with their members of Congress. So that's very much appreciated. Um, and you did mention some policies in there, Peter, that we're going to be talking about, I think. Um, I wanted to start out with the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA. Um, so I'm going to start with you, Carl, as we, we kind of dive into this, you know, we've, we've been talking about activism so far in our introductions and, you know, some of the biggest activists there have ever been, were working towards getting the ADA passed. Um, so I was wondering if you could just give us some background on that law, how it, how it came about and some of the, the ways it's, um, benefited the, the dis disability community over the years. Yeah, uh, happy to. And, uh, yeah, I feel like I should have brought two hats that I could have kept switching back and forth. So I had my lawyer hat that I could put on and then I could switch over and have my disability advocate hat on because uh, it's it's a little different uh, as I look at this. But yeah, the Americans with Disabilities Act was a law that was passed in 1990 uh, and uh, is intended to essentially allow for equal access for people with disabilities to a whole host of uh, places and services. 
Uh, and it's very broad in the way it's written. The definition of disability is very broad in uh, the law because it's intended to cover uh, the, uh, the largest percentage of people. Uh, as, a, as the organization I work for, lots of times I'll get the question, uh, well, how many people with disabilities are there in the, in the country? And I'm like, well, it depends how you're defining it. And uh, so uh, it does get a little complicated. And that's why I mentioned that the ADA has the broadest definition. Uh, so when you hear the term one in five or even one in four people in this country have a disability, that's the definition we're talking about. That's the broadest definition. Uh, and it is intended to really uh, cover a large group of Americans to make sure that we can access uh, the places and services uh, that we need. Uh, it, Like I said, it has a whole host of protections associated with it. Uh, for purposes of healthcare, the we focus more on the public accommodation section. Uh, it has employment protections as well, but the thing it's it's for in healthcare settings, is generally we're talking about um, the, the protections it allows for and uh, the uh, allowance it has for public accommodations. And specifically, we're looking at uh, you know making sure that those uh, places people can get into. Uh, so when you're talking about public places like hospitals and doctor's offices and all those kind of uh, healthcare facilities that we go into, they'd all be covered under those public accommodations uh, under the ADA. Now, the one thing that the ADA did not do uh, was the ADA did not say that it, it's it, it's still allowed for some discrimination. Uh, specifically, we, you know, Peter was just talking about the fact you've got uh, there was all kinds of rampant discrimination as it related to health insurance, uh, and you know, health insurance was not covered by the ADA, and there were still other areas of the ADA that were not covered. Uh, or were covered in a little more, um, it, it was not as clear. So that's why we really needed the second part of that, which is the Affordable Care Act, uh, which the Affordable Care Act really closed a lot of the loops, of the loopholes that existed in the ADA that still allowed for some disability discrimination. Uh, and along comes Section 1557 of the, um, of the Affordable Care Act, which sort of is the anti-discrimination provision within the ACA that sort of closes some of that off. So when we're talking about a lot of the areas now, when you're talking specifically about the healthcare uh, industry and making sure that there's accommodations there, yes, there's still the ADA, but there's also section 1557 of the ACA. Uh, and the Affordable Care Act is the one that really can protect us in a lot of these areas. And when you talk about specifically um, the, um, the disability community, one of the main things that you talk in terms of uh, issues that, that come about is around, say, for instance, uh, people who are deaf or hard of hearing and their communication and having ASL interpreters available in healthcare settings. And that is a real challenge. And the ACA basically is telling, um, and the regulations that have been put out by the Biden administration make it clear, those facilities have to uh, provide for ASL interpreters. Uh, and you've got to make sure that you've got that um, the ability for those folks to be able to communicate with their healthcare providers and not rely on a family member because, fr frankly, that's bad medicine. No, no other person would ask for, uh, you know, to, to talk to the other family member about someone's health. Uh, that any healthcare provider would tell you, no, you, there's certain things you can't discuss because of the sensitive nature of some of those things, you don't wanna discuss with a family member because the person may not feel comfortable telling you the true answers um, around their family, but they'll tell the healthcare provider one-on-one. -on -one, and that's what you really need with an ASL interpreter for those folks. So it's things like that, that the ACA really sort of closed the gap in some of the things that still existed uh, after the ADA. But there still is a long way to go. Uh, there are recommendations that were made by the Access Board uh, as it relates to um, accessible medical equipment in facilities. Uh, one of the projects that my organization has worked on for years is around uh, mammography uh, accessibility for women in wheelchairs and making sure that they're able to get access to uh, a, a mammogram uh, that will be, they'll be able to use and we'll be at a, at a level that the, they'll be able to um, effectively be uh, screened. And it's a fact that the facts are glaring when you see that the women with disabilities are much less likely to have those kind of screenings done. And a lot of that has to do with accessibility. Uh, and the Access Board has put out things on not just mammography uh, facilities, but on 
any sort of diagnostic testing or exam room tables and all those kind of things that people that use wheelchairs know all too well how difficult that can be so many times navigating the healthcare field. So those are all areas that still, there's still work that needs to be done in that area. The access board put out those recommendations, but those have not been put into law. Uh, so those are things that we still are working on to sort of uh, really uh, work to advocate for to make sure that those kind of things get passed. Wonderful, thank you. And I, I really appreciate that you um, connected the ACA to the ADA. Honest, honestly, typing up my notes, I kept writing ACA because I'm so used to it. Um, but it really has filled in some of the gaps. I think many people probably think of the ACA and think, oh, you know, the Obamacare marketplace kind of thing. But no, it did a lot more for a lot more people, um, especially those 1557 protections kind of a little known fact in there. So I'm really glad you raised that. Um, Emily, I kind of want to pass it over to you to talk a little bit about um, how the ADA has maybe impacted the communities you advocate with and what needs you still see. You know, Carl mentioned there are still some gaps in there. So, you know, how do you see it benefiting the communities you advocate with? And how do you see some maybe holes that need to be filled still? So I think because the stigma around mental illness, mental mis, mental disabilities are just so strong in in the community, it it there's kind of a disconnect I think with mental disability and the ADA, and so I think there's not even enough education there uh, in the community with regards to how individuals with mental disabilities. Um, can even access the benefits of the ADA. And, and I mean, because technically, if you are an individual who has, you know, because like, we're just, because when you, let's say you apply for a job and, and you're supposed to, um, cause I know that I've applied for the census before. And when you, when you on onboarding, uh, onboarding paperwork they will ask you like do you have any disabilities and and I think uh, and they tell you that you know if you share this this will not count against you but sometimes because the stigma of mental illness mental disabilities are so strong people will not check that and they don't even know that they're there they can even accommodate for their mental disability. And it's just, it's it's sad, I think, that even students also have lots of emotional struggles. And so they don't even, they're not able to even connect the dots that like schools and jobs, sites, workplaces are supposed to provide these, these accommodations. And, um, but sometimes if you share that you're, have that you have a mental disability you think that is going to count against you and people are going to not work you know they'll stigmatize you and it, it's just really difficult i mean i've talked about this topic even with uh dr ellen Sachs at usc and um she with the Sachs institute and it's really difficult for individuals with mental disabilities to be able to um gain employment because of the stigma and feeling like you're gonna be ostracized at work or, you know, will, will I ever be able to have a job again because of this disability? And it's, it's just very discouraging for, for people. And, and there's not enough education to connect the dots to say, no, if you, if you do say, if you state that you do have a mental disability, you, you can advocate for yourself to get accommodations, but then I think even trying to get accommodations and not every workplace is going to be accommodated, right? And because if the education is not there, then people at that job site are not going to be understanding. So it, it's been an uphill battle. And when I, 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 I like how John Lennon, he, he shares that, you know, being honest may not get you many friends, but at least you'll get the right ones. And so even in workplaces, I think this also 
you know, can translate into the workplace as well. If you're not in a working space uh, where people are understanding of your disability, then maybe that's not the right place to be. So that's my perspective. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think, you know, it can almost be lucky if you get an employer that really understands how to accommodate um, your disability if you need accommodation. So um, I, I know you mentioned um, getting help for students on campuses as well. And I, I was just reading lately that, you know, most staff at um, centers for students with disabilities on campuses don't actually have disabilities themselves. And it's it's hard, you know, they're not maybe as well versed in, in how to accommodate students if, if they're not actually, you know, from that community itself. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people in public health know that the, the best trusted messengers are those from within the communities. And it's, it's hard when for students on campus who may not have access to that. So thank you for mm -hmm. raising that. Mm -hmm. um, Peter, do you see any places where maybe the ADA could be built off of or, you know, have you seen the impact of the ADA in your own life as you navigate? I mean, uh, I think the biggest impact the ADA has had on me is allowing me to have a service dog. And that's been such a blessing as, you know, uh, for my physical and much more my mental well-being um and that's been that's been quite challenging i was i was probably a a big probably more of a big trailblazer in in manhattan than i realized when i when i um i had a uh my my dog that unfortunately passed away natasha uh i she was you know she was not a, a service animal and, and i had her trained to be one uh to respond to to my needs um and you know i would go into a grocery store and i wasn't uh i wasn't you know i mean immediately you know just given the no pets allowed and i said well she's not a pet she's a service dog i would i would basically have to educate every place that i went to where technically no pets were allowed then you know, these, these are, this is, you know, I'm, I had to share that I was, I had a disability and she was my service animal. Although I know I don't have to disclose that I have a disability, but, you know, I mean, some were, you know, quick to back off and others, you know, were, were not. And this, this is going back about 12 years ago. And, and I would say, you know, I've had some instances and, in, uh, you know, in cabs, um, I've had to report, you know, people because it was, you know, it was, it was pretty, you know, I would say I'm a pretty resourceful person when it comes to these things, but it's, you know, the people that don't, aren't well-versed, you know, that don't know their protections, uh, I think I, I, I really feel for them because, I'll save this for 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 later conversation, but um, it's it's again the the eighty is very complex. But here in in you know I live in Manhattan, New York, and in in New York City, there are only twenty five percent of the subway stations are ADA accessible. I mean, 25% in the biggest city in the country. I mean, that is quite shocking. So I would love to be involved to change that. And, you know, that definitely impacts me when I travel to my doctors. I have to make sure I know which station has accessibility because I cannot walk up flights of stairs. I don't have the mobility to do that. So it's 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 definitely challenged me in, in those areas that, that really come to mind. Yeah, I didn't know there was such a, a great proportion of New York City Metro stations that were not accessible. That's ridiculous. Um, I'm sure it's the same here in DC. Uh, 
Uh, D- not DC, acceptable and that's dc is actually pretty good when it comes to accessibility with uh, are we metro stops yeah that's good Which, uh it, yeah all the all the metro stops uh are accessible in dc uh new york now that doesn't always mean the elevators are working though um <laughs> i will say that um but uh they have a system in place that uh, i i get email alerts when an elevator goes down uh so there is ways to sort of plan ahead sometimes I will say this, the other problem I found with New York, Peter, is when I've been in New York, it can say that it's an accessible station, but it might not be accessible for the direction you want to go. That, that's the problem I found once is when I, it's like, oh, no, you can only go uptown uh, from the access, the accessible accessibility uh, elevator will only take you to the platform that goes uptown, so you can't go downtown at this station. And it's like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, so I've had some of those experiences in New York. It can get a little. I, I, I know, know that know there's it. there's issues also with the with the platforms not being wide enough. Um, I, I remember reading about that. I think at the Union Square station uh, in Manhattan. So yeah, it's just there's so many there. It's really it's really, I mean, it, it's not a priority. It's clearly clearly not a priority. I mean, I, the closest station to me is a major stop on 14th Street and 7th Avenue, and there is no elevator to get down to the platform. No elevator. Um, it's a major, major stop on the 1, 2, and 3 line here in New York City. It's just unbelievable. That's crazy. Well, I'm, I'm encouraged to hear that DC is not doing so poorly. Um, I've... I moved here right before the pandemic, so I haven't used the Metro that much. I don't, I haven't seen DC at all. Um, But speaking of the pandemic, um, you know, I think we can all agree that the pandemic has really shown a light on the holes in our healthcare system um, and how people are able to access healthcare. Um, So I think, Emily, I'll start with you on this one. Um, How has the pandemic impacted um, you and the communities that you you work with? You know, how how has life changed? Hmm. Okay, so I'm actually a uh, caregiver for my mother. And she's a person with disability, uh, immunocompromised. She has to uh, go to medical appointments uh, three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Uh, for several hours, and so I I pick her up, and um, you know I, I do this as a dutiful daughter, and because I love her, and um, and so the pandemic I haven't had to because she still has to go out for her medical appointments. Um, life is I've never had to really shelter in place, and so because of this specific situation. Um, and but we have had to move all of our support groups for NAMI virtually. So no more meeting in person and all of our support groups are actually online, but it's also helped us to um, like I can serve as backup for other other NAMI affiliates um, and when they need backup, because sometimes when a peer, an individual who has a mental health diagnosis and is a trained facilitator for NAMI needs a backup, then, you know, we can we can like look into our pool of of other peer trained peer facilitators and and help each other out because you know some things happen in life and we don't know what happens and so you know I filled in for other peer facilitators and um, it kind of almost brings help us bring the world together like I you know I, I feel like even though you guys are on the east coast and I'm on the west coast like I'm able to meet you guys, like not completely face to face, but almost face to face. And I can go to other um, support groups that are located in, you know, based normally in New York, Boston, San Francisco. Like it makes me feel like I can, like, yeah, it sucks that we have to like social distance and, and shelter in place all these years because of the pandemic. But at the same time, I think it also brings our worlds together so that we can advocate um, together, meet each other. It doesn't matter how far away we are because I'm even contacting my friends like in Taiwan, uh, in 
Japan, in Korea, in Chile, like, I, I, I feel like if I wanted to, I could attempt to do mental health awareness programs abroad. So it's exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Honestly, you know, as difficult as it's been being, you know, so distanced from people during the pandemic, you know, as someone with a disability and chronic illness, I've actually, I feel like I've flourished a little bit on Zoom because I can talk to people so well um, who are, you know, far away and I can make more connections. Um, and you, you can actually build real connections online, I believe, in my opinion. Um, you know, I, I have internet friends that I, I really value. So um, I think there is actually a lot of value to um, some of the remote ways that we've learned to communicate during the pandemic, um, especially through telehealth. That's been a huge um, benefit to a lot of people I know. Um, Carl, do you want to talk a little bit about how um, the pandemic's impacted um, the disability community from your vantage point? Sure, and uh, I'll, I'll give you some good, some bad, and some, and some possible silver linings down the road. Um, so uh, first of all, the good. Um, the one thing that, as you guys were just talking about, I think uh, that I really, I think as a disability community, we've really uh, been able to point to is how quickly everyone was able to move to remote work uh, through COVID. And so often people with disabilities would request as an accommodation working from home um, as an accommodation. And it was always, oh, we can't do that. We can't, that's not possible. Uh, and all these kind of things. And all of a sudden we all had to do it. And suddenly now it becomes, you know, something that is, is not that bad. And if anything, I think that that's one of the good things that come out of this is that people with disabilities that maybe have transportation issues or maybe they have, uh, they get uh, they get fatigued easily, so they need to be able to lay down in the middle of the day or something like that. It's really allowed those kind of people to maintain uh, gainful employment because they've been able to do it in this remote setting and not have to worry about the employer saying, oh, it can't be done because now they know it can be done. Uh, so that's one of the good things to come out of it. The bad thing is that many times, unfortunately, people with disabilities just get left behind and uh, we get we get forgotten. Uh, we see uh, many times, uh, you know, we his, throughout the whole pandemic. Uh, listen, I hate wearing masks as much as the next person does, but you know, it's one of those things that we do go, try to take care of each other. Uh, and while I might be vaxxed and in relatively decent health, uh, I want to make sure that I'm protecting those around me. Uh, and uh, the disability community gets forgotten, and many times. The guidance that comes out seems to forget that we still have people with disabilities and people who are immunocompromised living in our society. And it almost becomes, uh, you, you use the term that uh, gets thrown around, ableist, uh, when uh, you have people that are just willing to almost view those lives as expendable because uh, they're unfortunately uh, have some of those immunocompromised situations. And it's it's it, that's that's just not the way I think we should be acting as a civilized society. That's we should be taking care of those people who are vulnerable. And it's unfortunate that many times people with disabilities feel like they can't do certain things because they don't know if the protocols are gonna be in place that they can uh, truly be involved and uh, be able to know that they'll be safe. And then finally, one, um, one other thing I'll mention too, my organization had done a survey early on in COVID as it related to uh, you know, the COVID experience with people with disabilities and healthcare settings. And there was, most of it was, was relatively tracked with what a lot of other people were saying. They were able to do a lot of their visits with, via telehealth and all that kind of stuff. But one thing that really stood out that ended up becoming an issue is for people that use personal care attendant services. In other words, people that come into their homes to help them with activities of daily living. Um, uh, to have like an aide that comes in to help you get dressed or bathed or something like that. Those folks did not have access to PPE like other healthcare workers did, uh, which really then, and those are jobs that you can't do from six feet away. Uh, so you can't maintain social distancing while you're doing those. So that was really an area where, especially early on in the pandemic, uh, was problematic and uh, our survey had shown that. And then one final thing I'll say is a possible silver lining down the road, uh, one of the real, uh, and it's also, but it also is because of a unfortunate statistic, and that is so many statistics, so many of the deaths that have occurred uh, in COVID happened in uh, nursing homes and skilled nursing facilities. 
Um, and if this did not, uh, one, one thing I'm really hoping that comes out of this, and they, I know they tried to include it in the Build Back Better and what became the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, and it did not, it, it, it got left on the cutting room floor, but hopefully we can return back to getting more funding for home and community-based services. Um, because uh, giving people with disabilities the, uh, the right and the ability to receive care in their homes as opposed to a skilled nursing facility, unfortunately, the way Medicaid is set up, if you're on Medicaid and you need round-the-clock care, uh, you can get it in an institution. Uh, Medicaid is required to give it to you if you go into a skilled nursing facility, but you have to use do a waiting list if you want to do it in your home, which seems completely backwards, but that's the way the law is written. And uh, that's the one thing that I'm really hoping comes out of this is we realize because there were so many deaths that happened in skilled nursing facilities, that number could have been reduced by so much if we would just been, had been taking care of these people in their homes to begin with. Uh, and especially people with disabilities uh, that uh, want to live in their homes. Uh, want to be able to receive the care in their homes. So hopefully that's one thing that we can really push as a result of this to show here's something that it, it makes up it from a policy standpoint, it makes sense. From a financial standpoint, it makes sense because it's usually cheaper to take care of someone in their home than it is in an institution. And from a dignity standpoint, it makes sense. Uh, so all around, it, that's what makes sense. But uh, the law just has not gotten past to, to catch up to where we are as a society. Yeah, I, I hated to see that also land on the cutting room floor um, with Build Back Better and IRA. Um, it's unfortunate. I, you know, it was historic what they did with Medicare drug prices, and that's going to help a lot of people. We saw a lot of people left behind as well. Um, Peter, if you have thoughts on this, um, you know, what we we've talked about some some policies um here that we would like to see that kind of got lost in the pandemic what do you think what kind of policies should we see moving forward um what kind of practices what kind of behaviors are you going to continue that you've picked up during the pandemic and you think are going to help you stay healthy um beyond hopefully whenever the pandemic may come to an end or slow because it's not over yet no no, it is not over. Um, well, um, I ha do have a few choice words for the CDC, but I will refrain from using them. Um, it is, uh, I say that, I say that very, I, I really shouldn't even make light of it. Um, as a person in the disability community and chronic illness community, I feel very abandoned by the CDC and I don't remember somebody who represents me or, you know, whether it's a disability community or chronic illness community, I don't remember us giving input into what, you know, we needed. And these decisions have been made for millions of Americans. And, you know, I don't know what they're being modeled under. They're being modeled under that the majority of Americans have a good immune system or have been vaccinated. Um, it's just, that's just not my life. And, you know, I, again, I live in Manhattan and Frankly, most of the time, I am the only person wearing a mask, whether it's in my apartment building, whether it's been in a, in a grocery store, whether it's been on the subway, or whether it's just been walking down the street, I have my mask on because I have to protect myself. And by the CDC guidelines, they gave the authority for people, you know, to do that. And you know, the state could, can override it uh, if they so wish. But, you know, they're, it just, you know, it seems like it's all about money and it's not about lives. And it's just basically gave us the middle finger and it, is, it was incredibly discouraging, but um, I would love to see more input from our community. I would love to see much more outreach 
there is there's just not enough outreach it's just it just seems all about the economy and i mean you know the sad part is because of these policies people are going to die and not only that people are going to stay isolated because they're going to stay in their homes and they're not going to leave because they're going to be either afraid to leave or not able to leave because of their illnesses and that's not being taken into consideration and who's reaching these people um and i i was also informed you know, uh, the outreach for people that are considered homebound has been really shocking. Uh, you know, like for somewhere like in Los Angeles County, um, I mean, the outreach to people that are considered homebound, these are people like I'm considered homebound, but these are people that are able to leave their home for short periods of time. I mean, the, based on the definition, the outreach to them, the people that, that don't have broadband, the people that don't have access to media and know like that, you know, how are they, that they can get a vaccine, they can get a vaccine, somebody coming to their home. The outreach has been horrible to, a, to one of the, the most major counties in the country. I mean, you know, it's things like that that, that that just continue to shock me. Um, I just, I just, it, I mean, it, it has to change. It has to change because this is not going to be, I mean, we have monkeypox. I mean, we don't want to talk about that, but we do. And polio. So, I mean, we're, there's, there's, there's going to be more. I mean, it has to change. And I thought we learned as a society that it did. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad you did bring up monkeypox because that's it's a little bit concerning seeing where that's going. Um, considering we just went through a, a historic pandemic, and hopefully we have learned, gotten some some tips from that. Um, we're running short on time, but I did want to go back to Carl because you said an important word um, before ableism. Um, I was wondering if maybe you could just kind of briefly go over what what ableism is and how it's seen in day-to-day -day life by people in the disability community. People that have disabilities have probably, they know, it's one of those things, uh, you know, you know it when you see it uh, mm -hmm. kind of a thing. Uh, it's, uh, I, I don't know that I have a really good definition for ableism, but it's basically looking at, looking at life and uh, society and concerns that come up through the lens of someone that doesn't have a disability and completely ignoring the disability experience and what that means. Um, and we see it many times, we'll talk about, you know, the ADA did a lot to, you know, do away with discrimination in terms of, you know, physical barriers or communication barriers and all that kind of Listen stuff. Here. But what it doesn't do I'm is here. it doesn't- I ain't here like uh, once. It, it does not get rid of what I'll say is, you know, the idea of discrimination in people's hearts. Uh, and that's the attitudinal barriers that we face. Um, you know, I joke uh, about the fact that, you know, if I, because of my, uh, my health, um, I didn't start, I, I had, I've always had issues with walking, but didn't really start using a chair. My, my uh, knees have just degenerated over the years. Didn't really start using my, a chair until uh, I reached around age 30. And that's when I started using the chair. So I, I joke with people that I think my IQ points went down by about 50 points when I started using the chair based on the way some people would interact with me. They would immediately assume, oh, he's in a chair, he's got an intellectual disability too. And so you get this, this mindset of what disability looks like and people have this mindset of what disability looks like. And it, many times it does not jive with what the actual experience is. Uh, so I really do think that it's uh, a situation where, you know, it's about the attitudinal barriers that we exist, uh, we encounter in, um, you know, and we've been talking about healthcare, and healthcare settings is just one area. Uh, but it exists in a lot of areas. We, we were talking earlier about employment and, uh, you know, talking, you know, whether or not you disclose your, your disability or not. And uh, many times that becomes a question of, 
you know, whether or not um, you have a visible versus invisible disability, because of an invisible disability, it almost is, uh, it's, it's almost, I would say, unwise to disclose it, because uh, it becomes a problematic because of all the stigmas that are associated with it. And that's living in that world is what we talk about when you talk about ableism. That's what ableism is. It's because we don't feel like we can talk about it. And someone like me, who I've got very visible disabilities, I have to because, you know, people obviously are going to see the disabilities. So I have to go the other direction where I'm, if anything, over disclosing things and letting people know, you know, I don't, here's what, here's the accommodations I do need. Here's the accommodations I don't need, because sometimes I feel like people want to do too much for me, but I still want to have an independent life. So I don't feel like I need to necessarily have every, you know, I don't need to have everything done for me, but there are certain things I do need. I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, it's, I, I appreciate you sharing your story to demonstrate what ableism is, because I think that's the best way. It's, it's hard to define it, you're right. Um, but it's just through the acts themselves that you can really start getting an idea of what ableism really is. Um, I, I know, again, we're short on time and I wanna have a little bit of time for questions, but I did wanna pass it to Emily. Um, if you have anything to say about ableism um, as it relates to folks with mental illness. All right, so I just did want to say that it, it, I, in 2013, I had my own mental breakdown. This is pre-pandemic. And I made over 60 phone calls to help me help myself while having a mental breakdown. And it almost felt like every single phone call I made said, sorry, we can't help you. Here's another number. Here's another number. Here's another number. Here's another number. And I'm like, oh my God. God, when am I going to get the help that I need? And it was only sinking me into another depression because I'm like, God damn, like, this is the healthcare system? What the F? Like, and so um, I was like, okay, well, I don't like helplessness. I don't like feeling helpless. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to take a break from all these phone calls. I'm going to the library. I'm gonna go check out self-help books. And then like, you know, there's also online libraries now where people can check out books online so that we can learn from other people, self-help books to help us learn how to develop peace of mind. And I think that's really helped me help myself because it's like, it, if we're, we need to figure out, think outside of the box to, if this healthcare system is not going to help us, how do we get the best help? How do we actually help ourselves mentally, emotionally? How do we bring back that power? And one thing that when Peter was talking or, or, or Carl, one phrase that I've learned from the peer mental health movement is nothing about us without us. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, you know, if that actually came from the disability movement, because I have been affiliated with the Disabil uh, Dis Disability Rights California. And, you know, so they advocate for people who have been diagnosed with mental illness. And sometimes people with mental illness it's hard for them to advocate for themselves because if you're already having the struggles and you're not completely all there, like you need loved ones to also help you advocate for you because you're, you're already in a depression and you're already having struggles trying to find affordable mental health care. I'm like, my struggle is, all right, I'm not poor enough to receive services from the county, but I'm not rich enough to pay regular price. Regular price is friggin' like two hundred dollars, you know, and and it's it's still new for insurance companies to be able to cover, um, to cover those health, uh, mental health care for individuals, and so psychiatrists are they don't want to take insurance, and like all these costs are so expensive and I wish there was like a database that says here's all the pe people who provide sliding scale that are more affordable but it's, it's such so it is a headache to have to call each individual place 
to see who provides sliding scale that's more affordable. So yeah, those are some of the struggles that I have faced in, when dealing with seeking affordable mental health care. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned parity. Um, you know, the fact that that <clears throat> access to mental health care is supposed to be treated the same as physical health care now. Um, we have not entirely seen that happen yet. Um, you know, as you said, it's hard to find a psychiatrist that'll take insurance. It's hard to get, you know, inpatient treatment covered the same way it would cost, you know, to get, you know, I don't know, a surgery done. Um, it, we're not quite there yet. We're on the road, but we're not quite there. And that's, that's super frustrating. Um, we do have a couple minutes if we have a question or two. Um, I don't know, is Rachel looking at the chat? I have not looked at it. Well, I, if it's okay, um, can I just share my thoughts on ableism? Oh, sure, sure. I just want to make time we had qu for questions, but if, if we're good to go, oh, then I'm let's sorry. Go. Just, um, I just wanted to say uh, the best example that I could give is also is from a, I could give a, like my physical, like, and like I'm physically disabled in ways that are visible and invisible. But do you know how many times when I've used my cane that people ask me, what is my cane for? Like asking me, is it a fashion statement? Uh, and being somebody who suffers from lupus, you don't look sick. I can't give a better definition of that. And like, I have to justify how bad I'm feeling on a day. It's like those, those questions just, I mean, I can't speak for everybody who's been spoken to that way, but it's very crushing and uh, very demoralizing. So it's, don't, don't say that to people. It's wrong. And I just wanted to share that. Yeah, no, thank you. And, and speaking of don't say that to people, Allie has put in the chat, you know, um, ableism for mental illness looks like telling someone with depression to just get over it. Um, yeah, that's, that's not how it works, I'm sorry. Um, okay, well, those are all the questions that we have for this evening. I haven't seen any questions in the chat and it is just about nine o'clock. So, um, yeah, great. Once again, um, thank you to Emily, Carl, Peter, you all have been fabulous. Thank you so much for sharing, not just your expertise, but your personal experiences with us. That's, um, you know, I think like we were saying at the beginning, storytelling is really, uh, the best way to get out information about um, these issues. So if you've experienced it, don't hesitate to share your story if you're comfortable because people need to hear it. They need to hear it. Um, thank you to Healthcare Awareness Month for putting this on. We're so happy to be here in this conversation. I've really enjoyed it. I hope everyone else did. Um, thank you so much for all of the, the comments in the chat. We've been looking at those. So glad to have you all here. Um, keep up the good fight, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mina, Carl, Emily, Rachel, behind the scenes. Thank you all for being here. Yep. Bye. Bye-bye.